everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for Metrotech's Graduating Beyond Subscription Billing webinar. I just want to make sure that um, everyone can hear me, so if you can just raise your virtual hand in the GoToMeeting chat panel so I, I know that there's audio, that would be great. If I can, yep, I see hands raised, great. Okay, so thanks everyone. Um, okay, so my name is Allison McLaughlin. I am the uh, Marketing Director at Metrotech and your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know we have a um, question and answer session planned for the end of the webinar. So if you have um, questions at any point, please feel free to type the questions into the panel on the right side of um, your screen. And we'll take as many as time allots at the end of the webinar. You can also uh, keep the conversation going on Twitter. We have a hashtag for you to use. It's on the slide. It's um, hashtag beyond subscription. We'll be recording, uh, we'll be sending a recording of the webinar to all attendees and, and those who registered. So if you want to watch it again or share it with somebody else, you'll be able to do so. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce today's presenters. Let's start with Mike West. He is um, the Vice President and Distinguished Analyst at Sagatuck Technology. In 2000, Mike joined Sagatuck as an early co-founder after leaving Gartner, <coughs> excuse me, where he served as Vice President and Research Director. He's written and presented research on a wide variety of topics. His areas of uh, research and consulting expertise include cloud computing, enterprise-ready SaaS, ISVs in transition to SaaS, cloud and mobile development platforms, SaaS integration, social computing platforms, monetization, um, mobile commerce and mobile payments, and GRC. So welcome, Mike. We're glad to have you with us. Also, um, we have Jason Montanero. He's a global thought leader for cloud billing and micropayment technologies and our Metrotech Director of Product Management. Um, over the past 15 years, Jason has co-authored patents on micropayments and high-volume transactional aggregation. He jointly designed and acted as lead developer for the EO Transit Payment System, which was awarded the 2009 Best Transportation Application Sesame Award by Carson Identification and was instrumental to the American Public Transportation Association's 2009 Innovation Award to the Utah Transit Authority um, in Salt Lake City. So. Uh, Welcome, Jason. Thanks. All right, so both Mike and Jason will be educating and enlightening us on the topics of the limitations of subscription billing and graduating beyond it. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Mike? Thanks very much, Allison. Hi, I'm Mike Weston. Sagatuck Technology, my firm, is a recognized leader in subscription research and uh, strategy consulting services for uh, technology and software vendors and for business and IT services providers. We essentially help our clients make better business decisions and create business value through insights into key market trends and merging technologies driving real change. One of those changes has been the shift to the cloud. Let's talk for a moment about the limits of subscriptions and the transitions that uh, many uh, vendors had to make over the past several years. Uh, on slide two, you'll see the mass uh, exodus of uh, software to the cloud brought with it a monetization challenge for cloud solution providers. And you see in the image uh, a guy walking away from a table with a lot of money on it. Subscription billing is easy to understand. It was easy to understand for the guys who first came over to the cloud. It was easy for the people they were trying to sell to, uh, cloud solutions, SaaS in a word. Uh, and yet there were significant constraints, as we'll see later on in this uh, presentation. And it, uh, in effect, what happens when you can't uh, go beyond the constraints and you're limited to subscription billing, you're going to be leaving money on the table. So the, the point of this is that the earliest uh, pay-as-you-go pricing models uh, really combined a need to simplify the provider's value proposition 
uh, with the customer's desire for reduced capital outlay. In other words, you go to the cloud, you don't have to buy the computers, you don't have to buy the software, you install it. Everybody understands that model today, but in those days, you know, the greater flexibility to scale up or down with the, uh, you know, the trade-off uh, in that you're giving control to somebody else uh, for, you know, a, a service. Uh, and the service is, you know, uh, you want to cost something, and what is what is the basis for that pricing? What is the basis for uh, monetization? Is the key question, and the conceptual simplicity of per user per month, which was made popular by Salesforce.com, led to a knee-jerk response in favor of subscription licensing among ISVs migrating to the cloud and pure play cloud ISVs alike. But the thing is that subscriptions, while they make sense in many contexts, they don't in all. And there are countless monetization challenges that cannot be met by subscription billing. If you cannot bill for it, you cannot monetize it. So solution providers need an approach to monetization that fits their business and yields maximum profitability. Uh, now let's consider some of the challenges facing new cloud ISVs and, and why uh, they're sometimes puzzled by the billing challenge. When um, ISVs first move to the cloud in the, in the current competitive environment, pricing is one of those challenges that very few feel well equipped to deal with. Only a small percentage really considers monetization to be the primary challenge, especially in comparison with the operational challenges they face for the first time. So and the weight of, the, uh, of that issue is such that overall it is felt to have the greatest impact. So look at this chart, the eight leading transition challenges. And you can see um, that the, the leading challenge overall is building, changing, adapting our pricing strategy models. But it's made up of a sum of responses that include a small number of people considering it to be the number one challenge, a large one. Uh, that's the number two challenge. And, a, and another fairly large one, the number three challenge, when you add them all up, it's considered to be the overall uh, leading challenge. In comparison with, if you look at operating the cloud solution, and that red, which is the number one challenge, just zooms out to about 33%. That's the big challenge they feel. But then the other two don't really add up to be the same uh, degree. And operating the cloud solution also includes billing and payments. So what you've got is a situation where there are operational challenges that are seen as the first rated challenge, but that also includes the appropriate billing and payment solution. So while you know ISVs transitioning can take advantage of a wide number of tools to enable the cloud uh, to, to realize revenue, it's critical that they make a choice that gives them a sufficiently varied set of monetization capabilities, and they may not fully understand those. Uh, so how can um, cloud transitioning ISVs effectively manage this key operational challenge? Let's take a look at another pair of charts in the next slide. And you'll see in the, in the charts how operational challenges you know, require new processes. And for mature ISVs, that's an even more significant impact because now they have an evolving product portfolio as well as deepening partnerships with distributors and with their billing providers. So you can see in the, uh, in, in the, in the uh, operations, the lower right, uh, how, much, how big that section is about completely, some or completely new processes. They have to build new processes to deal with the complexity of their evolving challenge. You know, initially transitioning ISVs, yes, they have some operational challenges, they have some product development challenges, and they have technology challenges. But notice how big that operations challenge is for more mature cloud ISVs, and that includes things like partnering and alliances. So it's a much more complex thing over time. When you first get into the cloud, you'll see a few things. You'll maybe you set up with subscriptions, but subscriptions may not be sufficient to handle, as I say, that evolving product portfolio. Uh, the monetization solution you select has to be able to meet the challenges you're going to face in the marketplace in the competitive situations. You know, some of the things that were, are worth considering when selecting a billing solution provider are things like customer account management options, 
you know, the, the support for different kinds of service agreements or pricing models or billing plans, uh, what contract terms and what <coughs> rate plans are covered, uh, is their metering capability sufficiently flexible to meet the, the potential needs of the, of the company, if usage models are or may be, you know, part of the monetization approach as it evolves. So how complete the billing solution is may determine the provider's ability to respond competitively to a shift in the market. If you don't have the ability to monetize something, then you can't make that response to a competitor who has offered something that requires something that's outside your subscription capability. So while subscriptions may work as a placeholder for monetization, as business strategy evolves to include new offerings and partners, the limits of a subscription billing system begin to create constraints. Let's see how next. Slide five. Let's consider an infrastructure provider with a computer data center that sees periods of intense activity and other times when there's very little going on. So in order to achieve improved utilization of that data center, it would make sense to offer day of week rates or time of day rates that may provide incentives to buyers to make use of the underutilized periods and spread it out. By so, by so doing, the infrastructure provider can attract new customers drawn to the incentive pricing and shift other current customers to those underutilized day or day parts. Yeah. And that's rather than having to acquire additional capacity, increase operating costs to meet the needs of peak processing times, um, the provider can smooth out usage you know, across the underutilized periods and not only capture new revenue but avoid expense. So while subscriptions may work as a placeholder for monetization, as the business strategy evolves to include new offerings and partners, the limits of the subscription billing system may begin to create constraints. Or if you have a particular opportunity to operate more efficiently, lower expenses uh, uh, by modifying the way you bill, uh, that could also be precluded by your choice of a subscription billing provider. Now here's another example, um, slide six. A cloud marketing has targeting businesses selling to consumers was about to launch their cloud platform, offering email marketing, digital storage, commerce functionality, and social media, and initially targeting small to mid-sized businesses. Client businesses would, ex would experience a platform similar to Amazon with capability for selling products and services, full shipping integration, integration with Stripe, for instance, for reduced card fees. So customers would engage directly and purchase goods, products and services, and share information with other customers on the platform. However, once this solution was launched in the SMB space, the cloud marketing paths discovered it would no, have no way to scale to meet the needs of larger consumer enterprises, like, for instance, a Pizza Hut, for example because they could not manage the complex billing that was essential for meeting the needs of those customers. They would be constrained from offering their solution to large consumer enterprises because their current billing system could not go beyond subscriptions. Specifically, the cloud marketing provider needed to have a pricing model with a base subscription plus a percentage of transaction dollars because it was important to this cloud marketing startup to be able to scale up to those large consumer enterprises like the Pizza Huts of this world, they were forced to drop their billing provider and go with one that could offer much greater flexibility and monetization beyond their immediate needs. That was time consuming, that was expensive, uh, but at least they had the opportunity to move to a provider who could go beyond uh, simply subscription billing. And so they could not, wouldn't be constrained. Uh, had they launched without that capability, it would have proven very difficult and even more expensive to remedy that limitation. So the lesson here is cloud ISVs that need to pivot for different markets, maybe go up market or find a different niche, might find it impossible to do so and address those market needs. What should you remember from this brief discussion? Well, here are uh, one final set of thoughts. Um, on slide seven, uh, sort of pulling it all together. Uh, as monetization approaches has evolved over the past decade or so, an over-reliance on subscriptions 
has limited some providers even as it has enabled them to easily communicate their value proposition to potential buyers. Cloud ISVs should not lock into a subscription billing approach. Rather, their longer-term business needs are better served by aligning with more flexible monetization systems that can grow with them, that can pivot if necessary, and evolve as business needs evolve. So some of the things you may want to consider as you look for a monetization partner would be um, an unlimited set of account, contract, agreement, product, service, sales, and usage information to price, adjust, discount, or true up individual or aggregated events. Aggregations apply to combinations of accounts. And we'll hear more about sophisticated uh, discounting, uh, I think, in Jason's uh, presentation that, run, that runs across you know, complex organizational structures. Suppliers are channels that span multiple national jurisdictions and, and currency types. Um, you want, might want to look for dashboards that provide the customer or partner with a status against the agreement in place, uh, and so you know where you are. And, and then configurable threshold notifications to manage costs and meet promised commitments. Well, subscriptions make sense in many contexts. They hardly make sense in all. I think I've demonstrated several examples of monetization challenges that cannot be met by subscription billing, and I'm sure you can probably think of one or two more. Remember, if you can't bill for it, you can't monetize it. That much is clear. Solutions providers need an approach to monetization that fits their business and yields maximum profitability, and not the other way around. Well, thank you very much for um, listening to my presentation. I'd like to hand this back to uh, Jason and company for um, uh, for their part of the program. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Mike. Uh, it's very informative, and uh, I'll be taking on some of your points here in uh, my section of the slides here. So, so thanks a lot. So, you know, as, as Mike alluded to, you know, where does the trouble start? Well, you know, hopefully some of you will recognize this uh, humorous uh, picture from a, a movie that you might have seen, but you know, if you have sales, you have a billing problem. You know, that's really what it comes down to. And there's a couple of different ways that that uh, you know can start becoming a problem. You know, as, uh, you know, Mike alluded to. You know, there's uh, a lot of uh, you know ways people get started uh, in a business. It doesn't even have to be you know cloud or ISV. It's just in general. Uh, you know, starting is relatively uh, easy. You know, you can start with your MVP product. Maybe it's uh, you know, has a certain set of features. It has an expected price point. So having a simple subscription model is uh, straightforward um, and easy to support. Maybe you're using uh, recurring payments built into your payment gateway. Maybe just simple spreadsheets. Uh, maybe doing it by hand. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, economies of scale. Uh, you know, in doing things manually up until a certain point. But you know, as your business grows and you add more capabilities, and correspondingly you wind up having more feature sets and therefore more price points. You start to attract more types of customers. Some will be large and, and uh, have more demands of you, and uh, some will be smaller and want to use uh, you know, entry-level uh, versions of, of your products. But you can keep uh, you know, bifurcating your pricing and, and feature sets, and you know, things can get a little crazy uh, in this, and, and I've seen that in, in the past, but you know, you don't have to be uh, an expert uh, in, in calculus to see that this kind of lends itself naturally to, um, you know, a full event or, or usage-based uh, pricing model eventually. But even then, you know, that's still, uh, you know, what I would consider a pretty straightforward uh, billing or business model. So, you know, subscription or, or simple uh, usage-based, you know, they're kind of in the same category, and that's not really where the challenge lies. So where the challenge lies is, again, when it comes down to you know, sales and, and, and agility. So, you know, if you take, for example, uh, you know, starting with subscriptions, uh, maybe have even, you know, this usage-based billing service, you're kind of humming along, but, uh, you know, what we like to say is you wind up in the boiling the frog situation, or if you're not familiar with that phrase, it means that, uh, you know, if you put a frog in a cold pan of water and put it on the fire, uh, the water heats up so slowly that uh, the frog never realizes that it got to a point where he was uh, cooking himself uh, and passes away uh, euphemistically. Um, but so how does this really tie into uh, to billing in, in business models? So 
you know, perhaps you have a straightforward business you can manage with simple subscriptions, uh, but perhaps you land a big channel deal that brings you into, let's say, like overseas or some new market. Uh, this customer or partner has some special needs and has, you know, really negotiating power with you because you both want to make this work. So you start adding in some exceptions, maybe using a spreadsheet. It's a big revenue stream, so, you know, the economics work. What's the big deal? Of course, now your salespeople know that there are exceptions possible in the realm of, uh, you know, getting things closed by the end of the quarter. So they start to try and find more of these types of customers because you'd like to have more big customers. And they also start trying to negotiate deals. And, you know, what, what about just adding, you know, one other big customer who's not quite a channel but, you know, wants to kind of go down this path? So what does this, you know, does this lead to? So as you grow, you don't realize that the number of exceptions and modifications you slowly introduce over time to accommodate the latest and biggest customers, you know, new channels, new countries, new product lines. Now the company has multiple subsidiaries in different geographies. Maybe they want building in local currencies, but rolled up discounts. Maybe you have multiple subscription product lines and have to have cross product discounting. And you can see that, you know, all of a sudden your spreadsheet starts to grow. There's new fields and things start, to, you know, spiraling out of control. You know, before you know it, every deal has to be run through this complex spreadsheet. Emails to managers for exception approvals are required. You have to get the contracts people to do margin analysis for every single deal and validation with your current legal language for your contracts. You know, are you planning on going IPO? Do you plan on being acquiring? What's your, your exit strategy, your, your growth for your business? How can you audit this? You know, some say this is exactly why you should stick to simple subscriptions, but the simple fact of the matter is, is that, you know, infrastructure and combinations of business processes can come together how the business model evolves is a key point of growing your business. And as you think about it, really, it wasn't the business model that was a problem because your big customers and you yourselves negotiated this deal with a purpose. It made economic sense to you when you're negotiating it, and it's worth having. The trick is that you got to a point where your infrastructure was no longer capable of supporting this type of business complexity, even though that's where you want to take the business. So again, kind of uh, you know, digging into that, uh, that example some more, uh, here's an example uh, that's kind of a cleanse from uh, some, some customers that, uh, that we've worked with. And really, if all your business is about you know, simple A times B pricing, then sure, simple subscription models will work. But you know, here's an example where you may have that in multiple product lines but it's not really the pricing of the individual services that's really the complexity in the billing. It's really structuring the relationships uh, between you and big customers and their own organizations that lends itself to having more of the complexity. So again, maybe you have different subsidiaries in different regions that want to be billed in local currencies. They're using different uh, you know, products and services. Perhaps you grew through acquisition, so you have uh, product lines that were on one platform sold in one geography and others, and now this company says, hey, all my subsidiaries that used to do business with different companies are now doing business with one company that's you, and I want some sort of credit or, or discount to be reflected in my relationship with you. And of course, there's something that you want to negotiate. You want to keep that customer. It's a, it's a great relationship. It, it keeps your business going. So. You have to be able to layer in all these additional sets of complexity in terms of, you know, uh, cross currency conversions, roll ups, uh, cross product discounting, uh, and things of that nature. And oh, by the way, you know, because these are big customers, they're very picky. You know, uh, you often won't sign your contract on time. So, say for example, you do annual contracts or, or you know, biannual contracts. You want this big customer. Uh, you know, the contract doesn't get signed by the previous contract's expiration date. It gets signed like a couple weeks late. Are you going to start the billing from that time? Absolutely not. That customer expects that contract to be retroactively applied to all of your usage and invoices up until that point in time. So do you have systems that can go back and reprice and redo and recalculate everything and cascade all those changes throughout your organization and your accounting systems to make sense? All right. Another type of example uh, is some types of businesses are really structured around you know, what I would call maybe back-to-back -back transactions. So uh, this is not an example where you know simple A times B subscriptions or usage don't work entirely. Um, for example, you know we we do a lot of work with the exchanges and 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 uh, clearinghouses, which are really 
settlement models between buyers and sellers. You know, you often have bilateral negotiated rates. The service platform needs to track and properly invoice on behalf of as well as track the commission rate to each participant. So you really have single events that happen in a service, but they have multiple consequences to different parties that all need to be tracked and managed uh, simultaneously. Another good example is uh, app stores. Right, so if you think about an app store, you know, especially a lot of apps going to more in in the you know in app purchasing models. When that happens, you know, someone is making a single purchase for at a single price point, but what that's translating into is a commission for the app store manager, maybe a commission for the device manufacturer, maybe a commission for the network provider, maybe a final fee being put to the app creator. So the single transaction needs to get chopped up into multiple pieces each of which need to be maybe on different uh, schedules, for example. So let's dig into that uh, with a kind of a more com you know, complex example that uh, you know, we have some personal experience with here. Uh, so say, for example, a company makes a content store platform, and they sell this platform to media companies around the world. So content creators can get account with this platform. That means that they, when they create content, it can then become available in any of that content platform's uh, you know, customers for sale to their end users, so it's kind of a layered structure. So, say for example, uh, you know, a, a digital artist or, or somebody comes up with a, a new piece of content, uh, maybe in the Ukraine, uh, for example, and they put this in the platform, and now people all around the world who are working with, say, like uh, you know, NBC Universal or, or some other type of you know media distribution firm that maybe has embedded this platform into their their service offering, now can buy this uh, you know content. However, uh, there's a couple complexities with that. So customers of the content firms can buy the content, but because they're global companies, remember, these customers want to buy things in their currency that they want to use. And depending on where you are in the world, your payment method may vary. So for example, in you know, some places, credit cards are just fine. Other parts of the world, people really do their payments through their mobile uh, applications. The cost for doing these types of transactions are highly variable, so you need to be tracking in the platform not only what was bought and what currency was bought in, but what method of payment was used because this has cascading effects in terms of what should the price be to the end user, what cuts and how many cuts need to be made in terms of who supplies throughout the chain, and then at the end of the month or whatever sky school it is, at some point you need to send a check back to the content creator. So, you know, a single transaction winds up again having multiple faces in terms of uh, being calculated. So there's a lot of implications there. Another example, uh, you know, here that uh, I've encountered uh, on numerous occasions is if you have an exchange or, or a platform where you have multiple uh, channels, uh, they may expect you to take on more billing on behalf of their service. The challenge there is also taxes. So now it's not you providing a service and you having to calculate taxes from your point of view and your nexus and your jurisdictions, but now you need to emulate all the taxing perspectives of each of your channel partners who are asking you to do their billing on their behalf. So now you need to keep track of where both the buyers and the sellers are, which channel sold it, and charge the tax appropriately. And if you have really big channel partners, it's highly likely that they have negotiated one-off tax incentives from the local government that you have to keep track of you know, as exceptions to the rules. So it can get very complicated very quickly, even though from the end user perspective, the service offering to them may be something very straightforward. All right. So what does this wind up uh, being? Is that you wind up having lots of different transactions for lots of different amounts resulting from a single uh, you know, system. Now the question is, is you know, how best to approach that? So what we really have talked about here uh, you know, in, at Metrotech is do you want to have a cascade of systems or, or one mine? So you, know, you can think about each of these complex situations as multiple simple subscriptions. So it's a retail uh, billing system. It's a commission system. It's a settlement system. It's a payable system. You can have lots of these little systems that do very simple things and stitch them all together. But you know that makes me think of you know uh, you know the telephone game, right? So we get back into that situation that we all want to try to avoid uh, throughout all of our IT careers, uh, where you don't want to have to worry about 
who knows what data when and where does the data live and where is it owned. Uh, so it becomes much more practical as well as efficient uh, from an auditing and business perspective to have one system that has the capabilities to manage all these different directions of transactions with one single point of view and one master copy. So, and that's really what we kind of focus on uh, here from our perspective and, and our recommendations uh, for how people should deal with complexity. So, you know, I know we're running up on that time, so that actually wraps up my section of the uh, presentation, and uh, we want to open it up for questions. So I'll hand it back to Allison. Okay, great. Thanks, Jason, and thanks, Mike, um, for sharing those insights and knowledge on this topic today. So we do have a few minutes for questions. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, take the first one that's been listed here. Um, so Mike, I, I'm going to um, ask this one to you. Um, so why is subscription billing so popular? You well, know, uh, Allison, that's a good question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Hello? Yep, we can, can hear you. Good. Uh, well, uh, subscription billing became popular because it was simple to explain. Uh, and the CIO or the line of business executive, you know, could always rely on the same monthly bill. Uh, with small variations, of course. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, some buyers negotiated and locked in more favorable multi-year agreements with quarterly billing because, you know, they wanted predictability. <laughs> uh, so it became popular because, well, the cloud was scary and you needed to find a way to make it friendly. And so per user per month, everything was per user per month. It seemed like a really good deal. You're going to, you're just going to, it's uh, uh, just what, just what you consume, or you're just what the number of people uh, who use it, uh, you know, was the sort of model for subscription billing. And um, I think that it became popular because it was easy to understand and it was easy to manage. Um, but of course, it's limiting, as we know. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Okay. So uh, another question here. So. Um, is monetization just a fancy way to say pricing? You want to take that one, Mike? Okay, well, um, yeah, so in contrast to pricing, um, see, monetization can also include ways in which customers are acquired and billed for services. Um, for instance, Amazon uh, enjoys a huge advantage in, in the in cloud infrastructure space because of its monetization approach, which you could say is frictionless, um, <clears throat> uh, enabling you know buyers to um, accept billing, uh, licensing, and uh, licensing terms and conditions with a single click, and uh, credit card billing with just a few more keystrokes. So. The, the Amazon example would be to say the key is to make the offering not only easy to understand and easy to consume, easy to uh, to bill, but easy to interact with. So you enable the, the buy. You make the buy uh, uh, frictionless if possible. And so there should be no limits to the ability to uh, change pricing easily should uh, continuously lower pricing become the terms of competition, whatever. So, you know, monetization is a sort of a strategy that includes and embraces pricing uh, that goes well beyond it and includes the user experience. Okay. Great. Um, so here's uh, another question. Um, for usage-based monetization models, um, do you have any, any ideas um, that either uh, Jason or Mike can share uh, regarding overcoming the psychology of users avoiding a resource because it costs something every time they use it. So I can uh, take this one and, and actually I would kind of uh, flip it on its uh, head. Um, you know, one of the things that we refer to uh, in, in, in our uh, presentations and, and from what we've seen is the inverse of this model is also what we would call the subscription cliff. Right, so if you have a subscription-based model with multiple price tiers, 
you have kind of a similar situation where people may be in a tier and they may need to go beyond a certain subscription tier, but they don't feel like they're using enough to justify going to the next tier. So you just wind up foregoing uh, that that uh, that incremental uh, usage. So that's kind of actually the, the inverse of the problem that is just as applicable to subscriptions. In either case, it all comes down to uh, putting into part of your monetization scheme uh, ways to help make that customer comfortable. As Mike alluded to, is if you have the ability to say, you know, minimums or maximums in your your, your pricing models, or if you have a, a facility to provide real-time notifications and warnings. So perhaps you say, well, I know you're worried about the you know going over your consumption, but we can set up a warnings when you're within like 25 or, or 10 percent of reaching your limit to let you know when you're getting close so you can manage your budgeting. You can do a lot of customer-friendly things like that with the appropriate systems to kind of help overcome such a psychology. I don't know, Mike, if you have anything you want to add to that. No, I, I think that handles it uh, beautifully, Jason. Uh, again, I think the trick is just to consider uh, making it easy for the customer. Uh, and as in the example Jason provided, if you can help them to recognize you know, when they're when their budget is reaching uh, maximum, that's really important. Um, I, I heard an example of, of, uh, of scale, infinite scalability in the cloud just the other day where a, a government uh, entity, a very secret government entity, built a system that was uh, you know, guaranteed never to fail. And it would be able to use cloud resources infinitely and just continue to, to spawn additional servers uh, as required to scale up to meet any, any uh, level of, of demand. Uh, and then when this, the system was uh, put in place on a leading infrastructure provider's platform, uh, there was imme almost immediately a denial of service attack uh, that uh, caused it to spike. Uh, and within one hour, it had fully withstood uh, the denial of service attack, but it had blown through its entire year's budget. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen uh, situations like that uh, before where auto scaling uh, has, has some downsides in those types of situations. <laughs> okay, all right guys, well, um, so that's it for, for questions. Um, and uh, just want to um, wrap up the webinar for today. Um, I hope that you found um, the information um, that was provided to be insightful. Uh, for more information about Metrotech, you can visit us at metrotech.com. And if you'd like to speak with someone at Metrotech directly, you can email info at metrotech.com. Um, so thanks again to Mike and Jason for your time. And um, thanks to everyone who attended. Be on the lookout for a link with the recorded webinar so you can share it again. Uh, you can watch it again or share it with others. And thanks, and um, have a great day.